The immune system does not only defend against pathogens, it also manages the microbiome. The microbiome is now seen as an increasingly integral part of our own body. And the immune system, because it communicates so well with bacteria, actually is our essential tool for managing our microbiome. The traditional view, of course, is that the immune system is there to defend us against pathogens. But we now know that each of us is colonized by more than a thousand species of bacteria and a very large number of viruses. These are commensal. That means they don't normally cause disease in a healthy host. Now, some of them can in an immunocompromised host or if they change their niche. If you take E. coli out of the gut and you put it into the blood and muscle tissue, it can cause a disease. But normally in the gut, it is not pathogenic. Pathogens represent only a small fraction of the microbes that live in a host. Many of them are providing essential benefits. They produce vitamins. They help us to digest complex polysaccharides. They detoxify harmful chemicals and they compete with pathogens for intestinal niches. So our microbiome is actually doing a lot of things that benefit us. They also provide the stimulation of our developing tissues that causes the proper maturation of the immune system, which is a, a, an extremely interesting thing because it means that our own genome has delegated to other genomes the job of producing the signal that will create the system that will protect us against pathogens. How is the microbiome managed? Well, in addition to protecting the host, the immune system maintains a symbiotic relationship with commensal microorganisms. Your body is about 10% mammal and about 90% prokaryote. You are about 10 trillion mammal cells, and you are about 90 trillion bacterial cells, just to give you some idea. These trillions of bacteria are normally neutral or they're beneficial, and that coexistence is managed by the immune system. We see that when we see immunocompromised individuals. Now, they're suffering from an infection that is caused by the same microorganisms that are harmless in immune competent people. That means that the immune system must be operating not only to remove pathogens, but also to maintain host microbial homeostasis. And it does so by controlling the growth and invasion of commensal microbes that can cause disease in immunocompromised states. So that means that we have some opportunistic endogenous pathogens in us. And if they are not properly controlled, they can cause problems. Here is an example. Here is Lactobacillus lactis. What you have here are the ciliated cells, which are on the uh, gut mucosa. And it induces interleukin-10, which is sending out some weak singles, signals to T helper cells and T regulatory cells. Okay. Here are a couple of pathogens, and uh, one of them is Salmonella, the other is Pseudomonas. They interact with a ciliated cell in the gut mucosa to produce different signals, okay? So instead of interleukin-10, they're producing interleukin-1, interleukin-6, defensins. These then activate dendritic cells, neutrophils, and macrophages. So in the one case, you have a weak response and the toleration of a gut bacterium. And in the other case, you have a pathogen which is producing the full ramped up adaptive immune response. Now, the colonization of beneficial bacteria is encouraged by our bodies and by our immune system. We can see this in a very interesting case. Breast milk contains oligosaccharides, and they feed bifidobacteria. And bifidobacteria benefit the baby's immune system. Mucosal defensins and immunoglobulin A are shaping the microbial communities in the gut. 
they are actually maintaining a virtually sterile layer that is right next to the gut mucosa and just a little bit further out we have the gut microbiome. So these are uh, produced at high concentration in that boundary layer and they maintain a zone right next to the cells in which there are almost no bacteria. And then just outside that in the gut lumen there are trillions of bacteria. So the immune system is not only destroying invasive pathogens, which are just a small fraction, it's also managing microbial communities. And they are colonizing the host constitutively, and we are coming to think of them as just being another tissue of our body. Let's take a little closer look at natural probiotics. Human milk oligosaccharides are the third most abundant component of breast milk. When Bifidobacterium longum infantis is grown on human milk oligosaccharides, it adheres better to cultured human intestinal epithelial cells, and there it induces greater expression of anti-inflammatory cytokine, that's interleukin-10, and junctional adhesion molecules than do control strains that are grown on lactose. So what this basically says is that the mother is producing a substance that causes a bacterium in the baby to attach to and better signal to the cells that are in the baby's gut. So this causes us to, to wonder, well, what, what really is a pathogen? What, what is virulence? Some pathogens are virulent in one host, but not in another. That's extrinsic virulence, so that's defined more by the host than by the pathogen. An example would be Ebola virus, which is apparently harmless in fruit bats, but highly lethal in primates. Intrinsic virulence is defined by virulence genes and toxins that are in the pathogen, so it's clearly something which is mechanistically set up in the pathogen to injure the host, and that make it more virulent than similar microbes in the same host. So flu virus is more virulent than rhinovirus, and anthrax is more virulent than listeria. So by making those comparisons, we can start to get some handle on what virulence is. But really, the best way to understand extrinsic and intrinsic virulence is to look at a case where the coevolutionary trajectory of virulence and resistance can be measured in both the host and in the pathogen. And that's been done pretty well in the case of myxomatosis. And we'll see that in the, next in the next lecture. This, again, raises the issue of tolerance. So a pathogen can evolve to be less virulent, but the host can also evolve either to be more, vir more tolerant or more resistant. What's going on in coevolution usually is that both of these things are happening dynamically. And either way, a symbiotic relationship can be established. The pathogen can become less virulent. The host can become more tolerant. But the resulting intrinsic virulence is very different in the two cases. And that has important consequences for a naive host that lacks that coevolutionary history. These consequences played out dramatically when rinderpest was introduced from Eurasia to Africa. And so I now want to go through the rinderpest case in a little bit more detail. And the point of it is this. If you haven't co-evolved with something, what are the consequences? So here is the rinderpest virus. It's a native of Eurasia. It was new to Africa. It attacks cattle, buffalo, eland, giraffe, bushbuck, warthogs, and bush pigs. So it attacks a lot of ungulates, a lot of things that are related to cattle and sheep. It was endemic in Asia. It repeatedly got into Europe through human invasion, and when it got to Europe, it caused major problems with cattle in Europe. It got into Somaliland in cattle that were imported from Asia in 1889. Or it might have gotten in with Russian cattle that came to the relief, came with the relief of General Gordon in Khartoum in 1884. In either case, it got into sub-Saharan Africa in the late 19th century. 
By 1890, it was across the Sahara and it spread out into populations that had no evolved resistance. So it had a lot of direct consequences. These were the kinds of things that were getting infected, okay? So giraffes, wildebeests, stuff like that. Between 1890 and 1899, it spread over eastern, central, and southern Africa, a huge area. It eliminated most domestic cattle. It eliminated most wild buffalo, many related bovines. It, one species of antelope did go extinct completely. And the distribution of the other species remain altered right to this day. The pastoral and the nomadic people who were directly dependent on these sorts of organisms lost their food sources under the stress of starvation. There was an outbreak of endemic smallpox. And then there were subsequent epizootics, that is ep epidemics in animal populations in 1917, 1923, 1938. There were lots of indirect consequences uh, that are actually fascinating examples of ecological chain reactions. Over much of the infected area, because the ungulates had died off, the CT flies disappeared. They didn't have any blood to feed on anymore. Those flies require trees and bushes as habitat, and they require herbivores for food. The disappearance of game caused the appearance of man-eating lions. There were outbreaks of man-eating lions. During the 1920s, there was a lion in Uganda that killed 84 people. It was starving because uh, rinderpest had killed off the antelope. The presence of these man-eating lions caused the farmers to abandon large areas in which thickets of brush grew up. And there were a whole series of other consequences. The wild ungulates developed immunity to rinder pest. They then moved back into abandoned farming areas. They became hosts for the tsetse flies that could now live in new thickets of brush that were growing up. Because the flies transmitted sleeping sickness, both to the humans and to their cattle, the human population withdrew further and remained absent even after the lions switched back to eating ungulates and weren't eating people anymore. Some of those areas have now become the national parks of East Africa. I have been in the Serengeti and west of Serenera, between Serenera and Lake Victoria, there's a valley which is called the Valley of Death, and that's because there is so much sleeping sickness present in that valley. That's still part of the Serengeti. So to summarize Rinderpest, it changed the ecological structure of half a continent for at least a century. The consequences for humans were drastic. They were often indirect. For example, the uh, famine and the outbreak of endemic smallpox. And they were predictable only in retrospect. So Rinderpest did to African ungulates what measles and smallpox did to New World humans when European colonists introduced those old world diseases to the New World. Rinderpest has recently been completely eliminated by a vaccination campaign. So at this point, Rinderpest is not a problem in Africa, but it has left traces that will endure for a long time. It, it made the ecology of that continent ring like a bell. So to summarize, the immune system. The immune system not only defends against pathogens, it also manages the microbiome. Long coevolutionary interactions between humans and the bacteria in their microbiome have produced very precise physiological mechanisms that foster a symbiotic relationship. A good example of that is the production of oligosaccharides in breast milk that stimulate bifidobacteria that help to boost the appropriate immune response in the guts of infants. Virulence is the product of a host pathogen interaction it has components that are contributed by both host and by pathogen. We'll see that in detail in the next lecture. And we can see the consequences of host pathogen coevolution most clearly when they have not occurred. And that is the point of looking at the case of Rinderpest in Africa. That's what can happen when you do not have the coevolutionary uh, adjustment of the host pathogen interaction.